السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الفهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزاء نعلومك برحمتك يا رحم الراحم I am very happy and grateful to Allah سبحانه وتعالى for giving this توفيق to be here again a uh, few years ago I was in this building uh, and I always admire the work that you do and inshallah we pray for your success. My first topic uh, is Islamic theory of education. And what I'm going to share with you in these inshallah sessions include the following we would inshallah discuss knowledge and teaching and learning according to quran then we would inshallah talk about the same things knowledge teaching and learning according to hadith then we, sh we will talk about what should we study and what we mean by knowledge here then inshallah we will talk about sharing knowledge what is the significance of sharing knowledge and what value Islam gives to the teachers and the fact that we should not be putting any financial or worldly value when we are dealing with knowledge and then knowledge about uh, we will talk about the learning for the sake of Allah then we would have a discussion, inshallah, about the aims and essence of Islamic education. So what we want to achieve in Islamic education, because we are not just interested in passing on some information. So this will have uh, very important topics like the ma'rifa, the educational side of it when it comes to ma'rifa. We will talk about attitudes that we want to build in our trainees. We will talk about honor and dignity in particular that I think it's of utmost importance for us uh, when we want to prepare for coming up Imam Mahdi of Jalallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. And we will talk about certain practices that we should aim at achieving because if you don't know the priorities and you want to work on thousands of things in your classrooms and in your settings, you may not achieve anything. So you have to always prioritize and focus on the things that if they are established, they can bring other good things. But if you don't know the priorities and you will have very scattered attention, then you may not achieve anything or you may achieve something marginal. Sometimes we see if that, for example, inshallah, we talk about it, but just as an example, uh, we see we are working with a madrasa or, you know, with a school for many years. And uh, still our students, when it comes to the time of Salat, we need to be worried. We need to have people to watch them. We need to have people, you know, who bring discipline. This means that we didn't set our priorities right. One of the minimum achievements of any Islamic education is to build love for Salat and discipline in our trainees. So, inshallah, we will talk about this. So, these are some of the topics that, inshallah, we will talk about it. And if we get time, at the end, I want to focus on creating a culture of prayer and creating a culture of charity as two important 
manifestations of our uh, growth in nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it should bring automatically prayer and charity to the forefront of our practices. I have had this course uh, several times, so uh, some of them are available as lectures, so you can always refer to them. Uh, they are not exactly the same, and every time, you know, based on the situation, question, interactions can be different, but there is something that you can refer to, and inshallah with your du'as, I hope the book will come soon, inshallah, because everything is prepared, just needs my revision. Uh, I am also happy to uh, uh, introduce you a book that uh, I brought actually from London, uh, English translation of Muniyatul Murid. You know, Muniyatul Murid is a very good book by uh, the late Shahid Asani, Rahmatullah. Hey? And if you read the introduction to the book, he actually prepared this as a way to show he's qualified to teach in Sham. When he went there and he wanted to teach, they asked him you know, for some credentials. So he prepared this book, which is mashallah amazing. And uh, we had some, I don't know, 30, 40 sessions on Munyatul Murid, which are available but only on part of it, not all of it, uh, on the hadith about uh, knowledge. But alhamdulillah, the book is available along with other books that, inshallah, you can uh, browse and, inshallah, benefit. Okay, so if you are happy, please say salawat. Okay. So now we start with the Quranic emphasis on knowledge, teaching, and learning. It is very interesting that although Islam emerged in a society in which knowledge was not a priority and Literacy was not important at all. So knowledge, not a priority, but writing and registering books, essays, not very important. Because they were more relying on their memory and most of their knowledge, if they had knowledge, was about stories, poems, you know, this type of thing that they remembered by heart. They had good memories. There were some written pieces of poem, as you know, al muallaqatu sabah that they were so important and so rare that they fixed them on the walls of Kaaba inside as a source of their you know, heritage. Of course, some of them, they don't have good content. But uh, with respect to the linguistic side, they are uh, important for uh, people who want to study Arabic language. They are important, but content not that deep necessarily, and sometimes not very moral. So writing was not very important. In all Arab Peninsula, they say the number of people who were able to read or write was less than fingers of one person. Very rare to find someone to read and write. And therefore, if someone was able to read and write, this person was becoming very outstanding. And one wise plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to avoid Prophet to be put in this category was that he never read or write anything, wrote anything, because then they thought, oh, he's in this class of people that they have their own teachers, they have their own connections, and we cannot understand, maybe he has some sources. Therefore, Allah says, 
ما كنت تتلو من قبله من كتاب ولا تخطه بيمينك إذن لرتاب المبطلون those who are after false ideas not those who are interested in truth those who are after false ideas they would have then develop some doubt and put some question mark on your authenticity so in that society Islam brought a radical change and among the changes that Islam brought is emphasis on knowledge teaching and reading the very first revelation involved Iqra. It's unbelievable how in that society reading is important. And this is why I say Islam emerged in that society but was not fruit of that society. You know? It has its roots in somewhere else. If it was fruit of that society, you know, like for example, sometimes you see in some society, one type of art, one type of, I don't know, uh, entertainment, some recreational activities emerge. These are fruits of that society. You can see problems of the society or positive things of society reflected in these things, in arts, in movies, whatever. <coughs> but Islam was not fruit of that culture. That was culture of Jahiliyyah. But Islam starts with Iqra. Bismi Rabbik. Iqra. Not just Ibda Bismi Rabbik. Not just say Bismi Rabbik. Iqra. <laughs> or Noon wal qalam wa ma yasturun. Allah swears by qalam. In which society? A society that qalam is not important at all. Or as inshallah we mention, Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram alladhi allama bil-qalam. It doesn't make sense if you want to interpret everything according to that society. It only makes sense if it has its origin somewhere else. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Allah's guidance brought a radical change and made that society into a society in which people started learning. He appointed people especially to write down the Quran. They started writing down the Sirah of the Prophet, Hadith of the Prophet. Of course, unfortunately, something unpleasant happened. And maybe that was a trace of the previous culture. And that was to ban narrating and registering hadith. That, unfortunately, it affected majority of Muslims up to the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So for decades, there was a ban of compiling, registering, writing down, narrating hadith. But the Prophet ﷺ encouraged people to read, to write. We have many hadith about writing. You must preserve knowledge with writing down. By the way, you are writing down, yeah? <laughs> it's very important. You must always write down. So, or Oktob al ilm wa buthha fi ikhwanik. Write down and spread your knowledge. Fa innahu yati ala nasa zamanu harjan la yaanisuna fiha illa bi kutubihim. You must write down everything. A time would come that people would have nothing to be acquainted with and enjoy except these texts. Had it not been for great efforts of our ulama, today what we were going to do with Islam? If it was not that for centuries our ulama worked very, very hard to register everything 
even the chain of narration with all the details. And it was not like today. Today, you know, you can print 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 copies easily. They had to write down word by word. And in order to make sure there is no mistake, they had to do muqabala. For example, the teacher, the sheikh was reading and his students were checking or vice versa. All the book from beginning to end, they had to check. And then the sheikh says, now you can uh, you know, have permission to narrate this book. Then another book, then another book. We have Amali, many books, Amali Sheikh Tusi, Amali Sheikh Saduq, Amali Sheikh Mufid, Amali Sayyid Murtaza. What is Amali? The Sheikh was teaching, Hadith, reading, and they were writing down, dictating. So it says, for example, on Thursday, this day, this month, this year, these Hadiths were read by Sheikh Tusi, and they were writing down. So, a big change in that society. Now, when it comes to the Quran, I would like to refer to a few aspects of Quranic emphasis on knowledge. One, what type of image the Quran gives us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's the first question. Uh, we have a paper, Image of God in the Quran. I don't know if you have come across that. It's published in uh, God, Existence and Attributes. And that is a survey of all the names and attributes of Allah in the Quran. And you find that <coughs> after mercy, after rahmah, the quality which is more emphasized is knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran wants us to remember Allah as someone who is Rahim, Rahman, and someone who is knowledgeable, and then other things. Knowledge of Allah is very important. In Surah Talaq, Chapter 65, verse 12. Allah alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin wa min al-ard mithlahunna yatanazzalu al-amru baynahunna. Allah created seven skies. And from the earth, the same. So seven earth. There is a discussion here. What do we mean seven earth? You know, does it mean... Uh, seven earth, seven sky means 14 or some people say there are eight because every earth is a sky for the lower earth so it would be seven earth and one sky and if on top would be seven skies and one earth anyway there are seven earth, seven skies yatanazzalul amr baynahunna and the affairs come down from the skies to the earth. Why? Why Khalaka Sabah Samawatin wa minna al ardhimith lahunna yatanazzalu al amru baynahunna? Why? Lita'alam. Anna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir wa anna Allah qad ahata bi kulli shayin ilma. Creation is Muqaddima is a prerequisite for our ma'rifah. Allah created all this so that we can have this ma'rifah, this understanding that He is capable over everything and His knowledge embraces everything. لتعلموا أن الله على كل شيء قدير وأن الله قد أحاط بكل شيء علما it is very important for us to know that he knows everything and to know that he is capable of over everything and all surrounded with his rahmah. Question. 
Why is it important to know that he knows everything? It's very clear. Because if he doesn't know everything, how can then he create and run and manage the world? Number two, if he is not aware of everything, how he would know my needs and how he can help me with the best of solutions and how I can be sure that I can communicate to him and he understands me. Number three, if he doesn't know everything, why I should be worried about my hidden actions and hidden intentions? Yeah? So, because he knows everything, you would be extra careful and at the same time, you would be extra hopeful. Careful not to do anything wrong because he is seeing you and hopeful because you know that he has all the solutions and he is able to understand what you need and give you the best way of treating that. So, great emphasis on the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran also says in chapter 96 verse 14, Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. This is a very good ayah to remember or to put on a frame and put on your I don't know, library wall or somewhere to remember always. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Doesn't human being know that Allah is seeing him or her. Why Allah says ru'ya? Why he says seeing them? What do you guess? Why he doesn't just say Allah is khabir? Allah is alim? Why he says yara? Yes. Because he has direct knowledge. He sees it very clearly. Yes. Because for us human beings, the best type of knowledge, most of the time, not always, but for most of people, the best type of knowledge, the most certain knowledge, is when we see something with our eyes. Yeah? In Farsi, we say, Shenidan kei bovad manande didan. Even when you hear, <laughs> it's not as good as seeing. Yes? So, for us, the best type of knowledge is when we can see something. Yeah? But this is not necessarily the case, because I believe those who are rational, like great philosophers, they can trust what they understand through intellect more than what they can trust when they see with their eyes. But for most of people, no. The most important knowledge is when you see with your eyes. So, in order to help us understand that his knowledge of our actions is not less accurate and less detailed and less appealing than seeing he says yara otherwise he doesn't have you know sight like us you know physical vision and even this as i said is not the best type of knowledge but for us if you feel someone is watching you you feel more you know careful than Someone is receiving report about what you are doing. Yes? So, this is why in the Quran and Hadith, we use the concept of Basir for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and also we use Samir. Because sometimes it's something that cannot be seen. For example, two people talk to each other, whisper to each other. You cannot see what they say. You need someone to hear what they say. Okay? So we put emphasis on both. Sam'ah wal-basar. 
but it means that he has knowledge of what can be seen not that he can see with eyes what can be seen he has knowledge of what can be heard so alam ya'lam bi anna allaha yara doesn't man know that allah is seeing him no matter where you are <coughs> actually he can see you more than you can see yourself so one group of ayat one set of ayat that you can consider is ayat that describes allah as alim khabir the one who has knowledge alam <coughs> the one who is sami the one who is basir this is one group of ayat which shows the significance of knowledge another group of ayat is the ayat that describes allah as teacher allah is muallim yes uh, the late imam khomeini used to say muallimi shuqle and biast to be a teacher is the job of the prophets but Indeed, the Quran says it's the job of the <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophets also under Allah they teach. The main teacher is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman allam al-Quran. So who is the first muallim? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman. And maybe from this ayah we can understand that any muallim of quran must manifest rahma of ar rahman <laughs> it doesn't say allah allam al quran or al qahhar allam al quran yeah al muntaqim allam al quran al qazban allam al quran ar rahman allam al quran so when you teach islamic subject if you teach physics and chemistry still be kind but if you teach quran you must be extra kind because you are teaching the book of kindness yeah no nazzalu min al quran ma huwa shifaa'un wa rahma how can you teach the book of kindness with harshness unless you want to lose your job Allah will dismiss you. <laughs> Maybe people give you a job because people love, you know, people who are very harsh and, you know, always shout. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants people who are soft and kind when they want to deliver his message. So, Ar-Rahman Allam Al-Quran. Khalaq Al-Insan. Question. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Ar-Rahman khalaq al-insan first and then allam al-Qur'an. Yeah, because first we have to create human beings, then we can teach Qur'an. Because Allah is not referring to teaching the Qur'an to the angels. Teaching the Qur'an to human beings. The answer is teaching Qur'an is so important that although in time comes later, but in order comes first. Yeah, because what's the purpose of creating human beings? Is to guide them. So, had it not been for guidance, Allah would not have created us, because otherwise would be in vain. Do you think we have created in vain? You need guidance. So, guidance in order. in significance comes first although in time may come later okay like for example if you want to set up a school you have to maybe buy a little piece of land you have to prepare the design you have to make contract with developers builders you have to do lots of things but why you do all these things for educating people So education is more important for you. These are all needed for the sake of education. So, Ar-Rahman allam al-Qur'an khalaq al-insan but again allamahu al-bayan. 
So again, teaching comes. And this is also very important that Allah says He taught human beings al bayan and the common interpretation is that al bayan here means ability to express yourself because if you are not able to express yourself if you are not able to communicate you could not have meaningful human relation because human relation very much needs what communication this is why in logic and philosophy when they define al insan what do they say al insanu hayawanun natakun nutq although we have lots of discussion why they say nutq and this nutq means what i don't want to enter that discussion but anyway nutq and thinking are very much connected to each other and this is why you know, in Greek, they have logos, which means agl, but also means to talk. You know, it's a dialogue. Log comes from logos. Agl and talking are very much connected. If you are agl, you speak well. Yeah? Lesanu al tarjumanu agleh. So, if you are agl, you speak well. If you don't speak well, there is a problem in your aql. Either IQ is low or skills are not developed to utilize IQ. So communication is very important. Communication is so important that even Allah communicates to shaitan and let shaitan communicate to him. <laughs> so even with shaitan, Allah doesn't stop communication. Yes? Allah doesn't say don't talk to me even Allah tells us what his shaitan told him because communication is very important you have to understand what everyone is thinking and saying and even on the day of judgment munafiqun and mu'minun they have conversation Yes? So communication is very important. One of our problems that can lead to problems in marriage, in friendship, in community, is we are not good communicators. We feel embarrassed, we feel shy, we just develop anger and hatred, and when it reaches the point that we cannot able to take it, we release our anger, the relation is finished. <laughs> Instead of communicating from the beginning and trying to clarify things we keep it we keep it we keep it <coughs> then like a volcano everything comes and you, no one can fix the problem so <laughs> it means that to be able to speak is part of humanity this is why i say for us to have dialogue is natural we have to have dialogue. Unless there is exception. Mam and Amman, illa waqat khussa. There can be exception to any general rule. But the general rule is dialogue. So, Allam al Quran, Allamahul Bayan. Ta'aleem is so important. In Surah Alaq, verse 3, Iqra, wa al akram. After Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Al-Ladhi Khalaq, Khalaq Al-Insana Min Alaq, Iqra, Wa Rabbuka Al-Akram. Your Lord is the most honorable. Yeah, why? In Islamic view, what gives honor to someone? In some world views, money. In some world views, belonging to certain family or tribe ethnicity race yeah in islam karama doesn't come with, with any of these things karama comes with what with knowledge and taqwa 
inna akramakum indallahi atqakum but taqwa comes with knowledge at taqullah yu'allimukumullah taqwa without knowledge is not taqwa taqwa is built by knowledge awareness taqwa means awareness mindfulness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consciousness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is taqwa taqwa is not uh, to do certain things taqwa is more a state of mind and heart that you are very alert and you are very careful about what you say what you do what you plan your intention this is taqwa god wariness yeah so taqwa which comes with knowledge makes you akram more honorable now here اقرا وربك الاكرم الذي علم بالقلم so why he is akram perhaps it means because علم بالقلم because he's muallim علم الانسان ما لم يعلم so the one who has taught us what we didn't know he is to be honored more than anyone else and he has not used akram for himself when he talks about our creation when he talks about giving rizq or other things he uses al akram when he talks about teaching allama bil qalam wa allama al insana ma lam ya'lam so if you can teach something to a child a teenager a young person old person whatever never underestimate this blessing that allah has given you tawfiq to teach something and never measure its significance with worldly standards how much they are paying for this how much they are appreciating for this no you would underestimate if you put all dunya equal to teaching one ayah of quran اللهم صل على محمد I heard one famous reciter from Egypt who has died many years ago he was invited to go to a country and they discussed about the hadia so they said something he said no this is too little allah says la tashtaru bi ayati thamanan qalila <laughs> you should not take little price for my ayat okay as a joke it's good but if someone says this seriously it means that he has not understood the ayah at all la tashtaru bi ayati thamanan qalila it doesn't mean that if you teach quran charge them 1000 dollar per hour it means that if the whole dunya is given to you it's saman qalil because dunya is mata'un qalil so if i say the value of my work is very high don't think you know i teach one hour for 50 dollar or 100 I teach you one hour Quran, I charge you $1,000 because Quran is very important. As much as you bring these figures, you have underestimated the Quran. Therefore, some people who are careful, they are very hesitant to make employment contracts for being a scholar or teacher. Sometimes you have no choice. But if you had choice, You shouldn't say I work 40 hours as a resident alim or as a teacher and this is my salary and I accept it. What are you accepting? You cannot accept this as a contract. Your contract is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can say I am at your service if you can help me. Of course, unfortunately, sometimes if you don't put these things on the paper, 
from both sides, people can take advantage. I'm very sad. But this is not really Islamic. If you want to be really Islamic, when it comes to alim, when it comes to teachers of Islamic subjects, it should not be like a work contract. We have only one contract with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to work full time, not only eight hours, 24 hours for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, if you have tawfiq to teach, never underestimate, never easily replace it. I can teach in madrasa on Saturday or Sunday, but I can also go to work and make, you know, one full day of work and, you know, get salary. Never calculate like this. If you need money, okay, go and work. But if you are able to have a decent life, never compare them with figures. Nothing is like this. Then we have Allah teaching Adam alayhi salam. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا When angels had question, why Allah has decided to appoint his Khalifa of vicegerent, vicegerent on the earth, through human beings? Yeah, why? Why he cannot have an angel? They had question. This was a good question. This was not objection. This was not uh, disrespectful. They just asked question. أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ How did Allah convince them? No. This is, إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ was not to convince them. This was to tell them that there is something more. Be patient, I will explain to you. Okay? Then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Created a demonstration. Yeah? He didn't just say, you know, you must accept, don't ask questions. No. He tried to. So he first taught Adam all the names. Then presented them to the angels and said, Tell me, what are these names? Or what are the names of these things? Depending on how you interpret. They said, Subhanaka. La ilma lana illa ma allamtan. You know that we don't have any knowledge except what you have taught us. And this is not what you have taught us. We don't know this. Okay? They were very honest. They said, we don't know this. Of course, you may ask, this is not fair. Allah taught Adam and didn't teach them. Yeah? <laughs> what is the answer? Ah. Allah didn't teach them because they didn't have capacity. Because Allah never is stopping His grace if there is capacity. The only thing that Limit Allah's grace is what? Is a limit in capacity. Yeah. For example, we, we go to Niagara Fall. Someone takes one gallon of water, someone takes 100 liters of water, someone takes, you know, tank of water. Depending on your capacity, we have trillions of liters of, I don't know, water. So, Allah didn't teach angels because they didn't have capacity. Yeah, but taught Adam because Adam had the capacity. This was enough to solve the problem for angels. After that, they were convinced. So this shows how knowledge is important. That angels realize that Khilafatullah means to be Khalifatullah. More than anything else, depends on what? 
and knowledge. Not even tasbih and taqdis and hamd and praising Allah SWT. Although that is very important, but there is one type of tasbih that alim can do, that non-alim cannot do. Do you understand? إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ So, this is about Allah teaching the angels. And Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, عَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا Allah taught the Prophet what he didn't know. And Allah's favor upon the Prophet when it comes to teaching is great. <coughs> we don't use this expression Al-Fadlul Azim easily. Because for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nothing easily is considered as Azim. Yeah? Because Allah is so great that for him to be azim means it must be really great. For example, dunya is not azim for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But character of Prophet is azim. And the knowledge that Allah gave to the Prophet is also azim. So this shows significance of knowledge. Have taqwa. And among things that happen is that Allah will teach you. There is a special knowledge that doesn't come through learning at a school or you know, reading or taking notes. There is a special knowledge that comes directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What type of knowledge is that? Uh -huh. In my humble view, this knowledge is more practical knowledge. A knowledge that helps you to discern. A knowledge that helps you to make proper decisions. Not just theoretical knowledge. In furqana. What type of furqan is this? Furqan to understand that, for example, uh, this philosopher is right or that philosopher. I don't think that. Furqan in the sense that on said there are two proposals, two suggestions, two ways to do things. Which one is more wiser? Which one is better? Yeah? So it's practical knowledge, which is very important. Something that can make your life better. Something that can, that can make your community at first better. Can p qualify you for leadership better. I am not saying other types of knowledge would not come. But the main thing that we need and comes is practical knowledge. Practical wisdom. al hikmatul amaliyah And then we have about Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being Mu'allim. So we talked about Allah's knowledge, Allah being Mu'allim. Inshallah we can discuss this in the next session. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.